Welcome to the second module examining the causes of honeybee declines on pesticides. Make sure to take the previous quizzes while the information is still fresh in your minds. By the end of this module, you will have an understanding of how neonicotinoid insecticides affect honeybees, understand the trade-off between pest control and pollinator health, and have a detailed understanding of an integrated pest and pollinator management framework and how to apply this in a home garden. In the previous lecture, I discussed the role pathogens and parasites of honeybees play in declines of bees. This time, I will discuss the impacts of pesticides and other agricultural practices which are often inextricably linked with regards to the impacts they have on pollinator declines. For as long as people have been growing food, they've had issues with pest insects. Some of the oldest Chinese documents pertaining to agriculture describe the use of arsenic to combat rice pests. As cities grew and the demands for food became greater, so did the need for better insecticidal agents. This figure gives a relative timeline of when many of the pesticides still in use today first hit the markets. The chemistries of some products were known for over 50 years before their insecticidal properties were recognized. For example, DDT, a chlorinated hydrocarbon, was first synthesized in the 1870s though the insecticidal properties weren't recognized until 1939 when it was used to fight typhus and malaria during World War II. It was the era just after World War II when many new products were synthesized and marketed, which also coincides with the baby boom and the large-scale mechanization of agriculture in the United States and Europe. Notice the color of the boxes. Each insecticide has what is described as a mode of action or specific aspect of the insect's physiology that is targeted. Though chlorinated hydrocarbons and pyrethroids are different classes of insecticides separated by about 20 years of research and development, they have the same mode of action, which is to disrupt sodium channels in insects. The same is true for organophosphates and carbamates, which are acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. This is important because it means that once an insect develops resistance to one of these chemicals, it will have cross-resistance to others within the same class. In spite of documented cases of increasing resistance of harmful insect pests, it was over 30 years before a new class of insecticides was developed the neonicotinoids. Plant-incorporated pesticides followed soon after, but given the recent narrative surrounding the effects of neonicotinoids on honeybees specifically, we'll focus on this group as a case study. When it comes to naming pesticides, it can get a bit confusing. Every pesticide has three names. The chemical name, the common name for that chemical, and the trade name. Your guess is as good as mine for pronouncing those chemical names. When you hear the term neonicotinoid, it refers to a class of seven different pesticides whose common names are listed in the middle. Imidacloprid, thiamethoxam, clothianidin, acetamiprid, thiacloprid, dinotefuran, and nitinpyrum, and the trade name through which they are most often identified. But when you purchase a pesticide, either at a garden supply store or to apply on a farm, you're probably searching for products based on their trade name, which is how they are marketed to the general public. Another example is the weed killer glyphosate, which is marketed under the trade name Roundup. Currently, there are over 500 neonicotinoid containing products that are registered for use in 150 crops, ornamentals, landscape and veterinary medicine applications in the United States, though they're not all currently registered for use in Hawaii. The neonicotinoid insecticides, 
or neonics for short, activate the nicotinergic acetylcholinesterase receptors in the insect's nervous system. Don't stress too much about the big words. Basically, once exposed, the insect's nervous system fires continuously, causing tremors, paralysis, and eventually death. Sometimes you may see a bee or wasp flying in a fast circle near the ground. This disruption to orientation could be indicative of exposure to a neonic. These insecticides were developed to be systemic, meaning the insecticide doesn't sit on the outside of the plant leaves, but rather is taken up and circulated inside the plant. This makes them particularly effective against historically difficult to control pests, such as piercing and sucking insects like aphids, as well as some leaf chewing insects. However, being systemic, they reach parts of the plant other than the leaves and can actually concentrate in the pollen, which is consumed by beneficial insects. The first majorly publicized die-off of non-target insects as a result of neonic exposure was of bumblebees in Wilsonville, Oregon. In June of 2013, ironically during National Pollinator Week, over 50,000 bumblebees were found dead in a target parking lot after foraging on linden trees that had been treated with dinotefuran, which had been applied to 55 trees to control aphids whose honeydew had been dripping onto the cars. This caused a quick public backlash, and this incident started a broader national discussion on the safety of neonics to pollinators in general. This die-off occurred because the product had been applied during bloom and after a review period and to exercise an abundance of caution, the Oregon Department of Agriculture banned the use of products containing dinotefuran, imidacloprid, thiamethoxam, and clothianidin on linden trees in 2015. This may seem like a victory for the bees, but keep in mind, the pests are still attacking the linden trees and applicators now have to use older products that may not be as effective on those pests. Since that recorded event, a lot of research money has been spent worldwide to determine the full extent of impacts to pollinators, particularly bees. I too jumped on that bandwagon. To date, over 1,100 scientific studies have been published evaluating the effects of neonics on bees. My own research in South Dakota, an agricultural landscape dominated by prophylactically treated corn, found that conservation strips intended to boost pollinator habitat that had been planted near cornfields actually took up the pesticide from the adjacent farmland. In this case, I was measuring the concentration of clothianidin in bee bread or field-collected pollen that had been stored by the honeybees, nectar from the conservation strip plants, and from honey inside the hive. I found that flowers near organic corn had significantly less clothianidin in their pollen than flowers planted near conventionally treated cornfields, though the pesticide was present regardless of whether a farm used it or not indicating widespread landscape contamination. While the amount of clothianidin I recovered in nectar was really low, shown by the dotted line on the right graph, it was much higher in the honey. But this is actually what we would expect given the dehydration that occurs when converting nectar to honey. This is concerning, however, because it indicates that even after nectar is converted to honey, clothianidin does not break down inside the hive. While problematic at face value, keep in mind that the dose makes the poison, and these pesticide concentrations are too low to have any effect on humans. Even for the bees, with the concentrations I found, a single honeybee would have to consume 530 microliters of honey, or 17 stomachs full, in one sitting in order to experience a lethal toxic effect. Or 
they would have to consume the equivalent of 10 pollen balls in one sitting to experience a toxic effect. So though neonicotinoids were detected in pollen and honey, the concentrations were not high enough to kill the bees outright. However, I did find a significant negative effect of these concentrations on honeybee physiology, indicating a strong likelihood of sublethal effects. This implies that prophylactic treatments or using a pesticide whether you need it or not can have significant sublethal impacts on honeybees, which could then make them more susceptible to secondary stressors like pathogens or poor nutrition. As a follow-up to this study, I wanted to see how periods of starvation resulting from low pollen inputs while honeybees were developing as larvae would ultimately affect adult susceptibility to clothianidin exposure. For this, I established an apiary where half of the colonies had pollen traps restricting the flow of pollen, and the other half were supplemented with that pollen in addition to what they were already collecting. I maintained these pollen-deprived and supplemented treatments for a week until a cohort of larvae reached pupation. I emerged those as adults in the lab and then exposed them to clothianidin at field realistic exposures that I determined from my previous study. What I found was that when adult honeybees were reared in pollen-deprived conditions, they experienced greater mortality as a result of exposure to sublethal concentrations of clothianidin, or concentrations of 10 and 40 parts per billion. In contrast, when their colony had access to an excess of pollen, these same sublethal concentrations had no effect on adult bee mortality. This highlights the importance of nutrition in mitigating the effects of other stressors in the environment that honeybees may be exposed to, such as pesticides. It also demonstrates that the full impacts of neonics will be dependent on factors other than the pesticide itself, and that alternative steps can be taken to mitigate these effects before needing to ban a pesticide outright. Much of what we know now regarding neonic impacts to bees was information generated well after these pesticides were registered. But still, if they are so harmful to beneficial insects like pollinators, why bother with them at all? It's always a balance because there are benefits to these insecticides. When they were first introduced, they replaced a number of even more toxic compounds to which pests had developed resistance. The nature of how they work by being systemic, often coating seeds before they're planted, means they are really easy to use. Since crops take up the pesticide when they're still young, it confers protection against early season pests, which can often be the most damaging for seedling crops. As I mentioned before, they are effective against insect pests that are otherwise difficult to control and are really effective when they're necessary. They're also less toxic to mammals in comparison to older products. Unfortunately, their use is now largely prophylactic, particularly in parts of the country where row crops like corn and soybeans are grown. This leads to large amounts of pesticide in the environment that isn't always necessary, and that's costly to farmers. This means they're widespread in the landscape and thus can be taken up by non-target vegetation. They are toxic against beneficial insects and newer evidence suggests they may not be as safe as first thought. Further, their track record for increasing yields is a bit spotty. In a Center for Food Safety study, an analysis of all published studies found a negative economic return when neonics were applied to wheat, no positive benefit to yield in corn, dry beans, and canola, and a limited effect on yield with inconsistent protection in soybeans. This certainly raises questions about whether they are even necessary if yield or profits don't benefit from their use. Even with demonstrated positives and negatives of this particular class of insecticides, 
I want to point out that the neonics have become a bit of a scapegoat for what are really larger issues with regards to unnecessary or prophylactic use of pesticides in agricultural areas of all pesticide types, as well as in home gardens. These replaced even more ecologically harmful chemicals when they were first introduced in the 1990s, and there are circumstances in which their use is warranted but it is when they are used prophylactically that substantial environmental problems are likely to arise. Nevertheless, environmental groups have been successful in pushing to ban this group of insecticides because of the harm they cause pollinators. In response to declining honeybee populations in Europe, the European Union banned neonics in flowering crops in 2013 and recently expanded that ban for use on all field crops. This has been controversial because growers of certain crops, like sugar beets, now have no sustainable alternatives for pest control. Similar bills have been introduced in the United States, but have not had the support to move forward in the legislature at the national level. However, just this year in Hawaii, Senate Bill 445 was introduced, which would ban the use of neonics in the state without a permit from the Hawaii Department of Agriculture, effective in June of 2020. Keep in mind that it's always a balancing act. There will always be pests and pesticides will be needed to combat those in some circumstances. Even with negative impacts to pollinators, farmers will balance the economics of controlling their pest issues with maintaining healthy pollinator populations. Fortunately, there are integrated strategies anyone can adopt to minimize chemical use and non-target impacts to beneficial organisms. Integrated Pest Management, or IPM, is defined as using a combination of conventional and ecologically based pest control strategies based on science to minimize environmental impacts while maximizing crop yields. This definition is agriculture centric, but IPM can be applied to a number of circumstances, for example, controlling pests in your home. There are four major categories of pest control strategies that fall under this pest control paradigm, biological, cultural, physical, and chemical control. A typical IPM approach would look something like this. Let's pretend you're growing vegetables in your backyard. The first step in your IPM approach is going to be pest prevention. You won't have issues with pests if you employ strategies from the onset that reduce the likelihood of pest populations building up. Along with prevention is monitoring. You should never treat for a pest unless you have confirmed that it is present. Doing so contributes to ongoing issues with prophylactic pesticide treatments. If in your monitoring you notice something, such as a new insect or pathogen in your garden, identify it. Continue to monitor it to see if it reaches economically damaging levels. If this happens, identification is critical for choosing a least toxic intervention for that pest. Evaluate after a treatment to determine whether the pest was reduced below economic thresholds. If so, great. Go back to preventative measures to minimize the likelihood of that pest becoming an issue again. If, on the other hand, these toxic interventions prove unsuccessful, it is okay to choose a chemical control method. Just like farming, home gardening is a lot of work and you shouldn't be afraid to use all the tools available to control pests and not waste the effort you have put in. But by using them in the context of an IPM framework, you will hopefully be minimizing chemical inputs and lessening non-target effects to beneficial insects in the environment. But what about bees and other pollinators? How do they fit into this paradigm? Well, the IPM paradigm that is already largely understood by growers and home gardeners can be used to facilitate the adoption of pollinator protection practices through an integrated pest and pollinator management framework, 
or IPPM. This is defined as the integration of alternative pollinators into crop production systems and integrating the welfare of all pollinators into an IPM protection program by only slightly tweaking the practices we use for biological, cultural, physical, and chemical control, we can easily adapt best management practices to also benefit pollinators. Let's break down what the control methods actually are and how pollinator conservation can be integrated into each one. Biological control is using natural enemies, such as predators, parasites, and parasitoids to reduce pest populations. For the home gardener, this means providing habitat for beneficial insects and other groups, like birds and lizards, to help control pest insect populations. Classical biocontrol is when natural enemies of an exotic origin are introduced permanently to control a pest of the same exotic origin. This is a lengthy research process that requires years of development and permits. So while there are examples of success with this approach in Hawaii, you as a private citizen won't be able to do this on your own. Augmentative biocontrol is when you mass rear and release natural enemies that are already present within a region. Home gardeners could do this by encouraging ladybugs in certain areas of their garden then transplanting these voracious predators to another area where pests are present. Conservation biocontrol is when you actively enhance habitat for natural enemies and is the strategy that will have the greatest positive effect on pollinators. Many predators, like wasps and ladybugs, also require carbohydrate and plant protein sources to survive, which they obtain from flowers. By incorporating insectary plants into the landscape, you encourage not only the beneficial groups, but support healthy local pollinator populations as well. Cultural control refers to techniques and strategies that can be applied by you that disrupt pest life cycles or remove extra habitat where they may thrive or reproduce. For the most part, these are beneficial practices for pollinators. The first of these is reducing or disrupting pest habitat. This includes sanitation or removing debris that pests may thrive in, though this can also compromise soil health by removing substrate for microbes or exposing bare ground that could contrib contribute to Phytophthora infections. Tilling helps to kill any pests that may live in the soil though it also contributes to worse weed issues, and in areas where ground nesting bees are present, it can destroy their nests. Cover crops may also disrupt pest habitat when incorporating flowering plants that may be deterrent to the pests. Pests may be diverted away from gardens by trap cropping with same or similar host species that are preferential to what you are growing or strip harvesting which is a good stewardship practice that reduces the disruption of all pests from your garden or field to your neighbors in the event you harvest first. Adjusting planting schedules interferes with life cycles of pests as well and can be achieved by adjusting plant spacing to increase or decrease space between plants, depending on how the pest insect locates its host, planting dissimilar crops next to each other, crop rotations, which prevents the buildup of soil pathogens in the same area and adjusting crop planting times. This is especially helpful for early season pests. If you can plant a little later, then your plants could possibly develop after the dispersive stage of the pest is over. Finally, reducing yield reductions can be achieved by planting genetically resistant or pest tolerant varieties that minimize chemical inputs keeping plants healthy so their immune systems can also help fight off pests and harvesting early when possible. Finally, physical control measures act to physically block the pest from reaching the crop, which can be achieved using screen houses or floating row covers. Good old fashioned hand picking of larger pests like caterpillars and products like Tanglefoot 
which prevent crawling pests from climbing into orchard trees. This is helpful against ants, which will tend other insect pests for honeydew and fight off biocontrol agents. Sometimes you'll see palm trees with metal around the trunks. This is to prevent rats from nesting in the canopies and follows the same principle. Keep in mind that when you block the pest, you're also blocking the pollinator. So row covers may be best deployed at night to keep out moths, such that pollinators have access during the day or only using them on self-compatible plants that don't require pollination. Going back to our diagram of the IPPM approach, the control measures I spoke of would mostly fit under the preventative stage of IPPM. Monitoring and identification are relatively self-explanatory, and many of you volunteer in your county call centers and at public events where you assist with just that. So let's discuss pollinator-friendly options for controlling pests once they have been identified. Least toxic interventions mostly include low toxicity organic options, some of which are described here. However, it is always important to follow the label directions to make sure these products are applied correctly. Some are only effective against certain life stages and must come into direct contact with the pest to be effective as they have no residual efficacy. Keep in mind that none of these are pest specific, meaning they will kill any insect they come into contact with, including pollinators. So apply with caution and avoid spraying flowering parts of the plants visited by pollinators. Also, make sure they're safe to use on your particular plant, as the smothering capabilities may kill plants when they're applied incorrectly. After using a least toxic intervention, evaluate to see how effective it was. Are the pests reduced or gone? Does the plant look healthier? Are any pest insect populations below economic thresholds? Just because pest insects are present on a plant does not mean you need to treat them. It is only when populations get great enough that they overwhelm the plant's immune system. So as long as you've knocked them below that threshold with your preliminary treatment, you don't need to pursue another treatment and can go back to preventative practices and monitoring. However, sometimes pests do not respond to other methods or their populations increase too rapidly for a least toxic method to be effective. In these cases, it's okay to use a chemical control. Just be sure to read the label to make sure that the product is approved for use on the plant and against that specific pest. Quick pop quiz. Both organic and conventional pesticides can be a part of a responsible IPPM framework, but are organic pesticides safer for beneficial insects? Not necessarily. Broad spectrum insecticides do not distinguish between insect groups, regardless of whether they are organic or conventional. Organic just means that the pesticide is derived from a natural source, while conventional are synthesized in the lab. However, the exact same chemical could be in products labeled as organic and conventional. For example, pyrethrum is an organic insecticide that is derived from chrysanthemum flowers. The conventional alternative, pyrethroids, are the same chemical, just synthesized in the lab. The table on the right lists organic pesticides and their relative toxicity to honeybees and was compiled by the Xerces Society. The products highlighted in yellow are found at home improvement stores on Oahu in pest control aisles. What I want to point out here is that though they are organic, almost all are considered highly toxic to bees. I just want to emphasize that for garden pesticides, it is how you are using a product, not necessarily what you're using, that determines how toxic it will be to bees and other beneficial insects in your garden.
So always read the label. The reason being the product may require dilutions. Application timing could reduce non-target effects, such as spraying outside of bloom times or spraying in the early morning or evening when bees aren't flying. Captain Jack's dead bug pictured here is a certified organic pesticide, but notice how under environmental hazards, it states that the product is toxic to bees and aquatic invertebrates. The product producers recommend spraying outside of bloom times and early or late in the day and when it isn't raining. Bayer's three-in-one product, which is conventional, is also toxic to honeybees, but only if they're exposed to a direct application. Dried residues are not toxic, so applying during non-foraging periods will minimize any effects. Not all chemicals may be safe on edible plants, so if using in a home vegetable garden, double check this. Improper applications could also damage plants, as I mentioned with insecticidal soaps. Finally, adhere to application intervals. If a product didn't work the first time, there is either a delay between application and death, the product isn't appropriate for the pest, or the pest is resistant and you need to choose something else. In response to declining honeybees in the US, the Environmental Protection Agency did develop a label to be put on certain pesticides that are particularly toxic to honeybees as an additional caution to applicators and farmers. Their guidelines mirror what we've already discussed and include spraying when pollinators are not active and outside of bloom times, choosing targeted versus broad spectrum insecticides whenever possible, only spraying areas that have the pests and avoid spraying refuges where bees and other beneficial insects may be foraging, and moving colonies before an area-wide spray. This IPM discussion has been very centric on farmers and gardeners who may be applying pesticides to bee forage plants. However, pesticides are inside the hive as well, and there are steps beekeepers can take to minimize this. In a landmark study from 2010, a team of researchers found very high levels of fungicides and miticides in beeswax from colonies across North America. Over 87 pesticides or their metabolites were detected in beeswax, with some samples having as many as 39 different chemicals present, though on average there were eight pesticides per wax sample. Unsurprisingly, almost all samples tested positive for miticides, but it was a surprise at how many samples were positive for agricultural fungicides. But it should be noted that these chemicals were in the wax, and we still do not know the effects that pesticides in the wax have on developing brood, though the effect is likely minimal. But this does provide a justification for cycling out old frames and foundation from colonies as well as employing some of the organic mite control options that are available in Hawaii and discussed in the previous video. Non-chemical alternatives should also be considered, such as drone brood removal. For small hive beetles, using paper towels to aid the bees in trapping adults is very successful in apiaries across the state. This concludes module eight. Don't forget to take the quiz while the information is still fresh in your mind. Stay tuned for the next video on nutrition as a cause for pollinator declines.